find the reading of this word. Please be seated. How many of you have played the, the game, uh, I don't know, especially during birthdays, there's a piñata? Huh? Or in the Philippines, we don't have piñata, we have the, uh, yeah? the uh, breaking the palayo. <laughs> And inside that uh, that piñata is all the candies and the goodies. And inside the palayop is uh, all the same candies. Huh? And uh, the game goes like this. So all will be uh, will be have a chance to break that piñata or break the palayop. But you are blindfolded. Blindfolded. That means uh, you're not supposed to see a lot of things. In fact, nothing. You will see nothing. And being blindfolded, there's nothing to see. Everything is dark. Hmm? You don't know where you're going. And the people will be shouting and yelling and laughing at you. You probably bump a tree. Or probably you trip on a stepping stone. And you swing the bat and you hit the air. You hit the air, people are laughing. And sometimes there's a danger of hitting somebody else, especially if the, 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 the children are there and trying to have fun. And so if you don't hit the, the if you don't hit the the piñata, then another person takes his turn until the piñata or the palayok is hit. And everybody scrambles for the goodies, and then game over. It's funny, but sometimes it's dangerous what people do when they are blindfolded. Have you tried going around your house blindfolded? This is the basic assumption of this verse that we of the verses that we just read. There's a premise. Not promise, but premise, meaning the basic assumption of Jesus' statement when he said, you are the salt of the earth. When he said, you are the light of the world. Now, the premise or the basic assumption is this, that they were living in a decaying, dark world. They are living in a, in a place or their surroundings, some surroundings is, is so corrupt, <coughs> so sinful, and so dark. Let me give you a the description right then and there in, in, in Acts chapter 26 verse 18, which was written almost 2,000 years ago. It says, to open the eyes that they may turn from darkness to light. So because they are living in a world of darkness. And from the dominion of Satan into God. That means that <coughs> world then was considered the dominion of Satan. That they may receive forgiveness of sin. Hmm? In other words, all around them is sinful. That was the description of the then world 2,000 years ago. Another verse in John chapter 3 verses 19 to 20 it says, Men loved the darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Most crimes are done when it's dark. <laughs> because they don't want to be seen by people. So that was the description of the world out there during the time when Jesus said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. 
But so many years has passed by since that time. 2,000 years. And the world's progress should have helped in changing the world, in giving light, and stopping the corruption in this world. Of course, we have science and technology has brought so many conveniences in our homes, in our lives. Travel, well, then they were traveling by walking. I know there's somebody who walked five miles because no, uh, no transportation. But during that time, they only walk and they found out that they can ride the horse or ride the camel, so they, they use animals. And then later on, they discovered the wheel and then they were able to invent the cars. Now we have fast cars, we have trains, and we have airplanes. And actually, it's no longer impossible these days to have breakfast in New York, lunch, meeting in Chicago, and a dinner date in Houston on the same day. That's no longer impossible because of the fast travel. I've heard that they, they have a project that they're going to build a tube from San Francisco to LA. You know, if you drive from San Francisco to LA, it takes about at least eight hours drive. If you ride the airplane from San Francisco to LA, it's about an hour's drive. And they say that this transportation through this tube that they are going to make will, have, will be about less than 30 minutes from San Francisco to LA. That's very fast. That's our progress. Okay? Of course, many years ago, we have already placed man on the moon. Now they're placing men in, in Mars and in different planets. We have all these conveniences in our homes. And I, I came from the Philippines. I'm so excited because uh, in the Philippines, we, we need somebody to, to cook for our food. We need somebody to wash our our clothes, we need somebody to clean the house, we need somebody to uh, take care of so many things. But now, we have microwaves, coffee makers, dishwashers, washers and dryers. The question is, do we really have time even at these particular days, we have all these conveniences. Do we really have time to enjoy life? When I was born, the, the fastest uh, way, uh, one of the fastest way to, to communicate was through telegram. And then, after that, uh, if you want it faster, you use the telephone. And you want it a little more faster, you tell a woman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just testing if you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember uh, back in Illinois, uh, they, they started using the bag phone, you know. The Motorola bag phone. Oh, huh? yeah. <laughs> you need you need a bag, and then you use the phone. It's wireless, but you have a, you need to have a big bag. Before that, only doctors had that in the Philippines. Huh? But <clears throat> but now we have the cell phones, okay? And we have the smartphones. And now you can have a smartphone on your watch. And now you can also have a smartphone in your earphone. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. We can avail of the most expensive items, most expensive beds, and the pillows, you know, beds that you can just adjust the cushion, you know, 
What uh, if you want it harder or softer? But the question is, are we sleeping more soundly and securely? The world's progress should have helped. But in spite of all this, the world is still in darkness. Science and technology has brought also to us the stealth fighters, the bombers, the cruise missiles that can target a certain location from the sky or from the sea or from the land and destroy lives and property, destroy hundreds and thousands of people. We have invented weapons of mass destruction. Many years ago, we, we only think of the U.S. and the Russia having nuclear weapons. Now, many more countries are aspiring for nuclear weapons, such as Iran, uh, uh, China, and North Korea. Corruption in this world gets more intense and rampant. Crime is at all-time high. Did you know the jails are all overcrowded? Families are in disarray with divorces with the uh, um, fathers always absent in the family. Divorces are all time high too. And during that time, 2,000 years ago, and even more, many more hundreds of years ago, the heathen nations, they offer their children as a sacrifice to the God they call God Moloch in the altar. Nowadays, Babies by the millions are being sacrificed on the altars of abortion. Is that an improvement? It was already dark during that time. And I believe that the world is even darker this time. We are living in conditions that parallel Sodom and Gomorrah. The pagan gods of sex and pleasure are being worshipped by greater numbers than in any period of history. Think about for pornography. You can find that anywhere, even inside your house, in the internet. It's always available. And so this is the premise. It's not only then that the work was dark and decaying. Even now, at this particular time, our world is even more worse, <coughs> decaying and dark. And that's the background when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. So here's his plan. That's the premise. Here's the plan. The plan is what Jesus said. He was talking to his disciples. He said, you are the salt of the earth. He was talking to his disciples. He said, you are the light of the world. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, they were still alive then. And many years has passed. All those disciples who were standing there are now dead. But even though they're dead, the message of Jesus are for those, for all of those who claim to, to, who claim to be the followers of Jesus. And even it includes all of us here. If you claim that you are a disciple of Jesus, if you claim that you are a Christian, a believer, then this statement, this plan that Jesus laid down is for you, is for us. In fact, Jesus, before he said, you are the light of the world, he said, 
while he was still ministering here on earth, he said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am the light of the world. He never ceased to be the light of the world. He is the source of that light. But when be, before he left the earth, he was talking to his disciple now and said, you are the light of the world. How could that be? Well, a while ago I read this verse in John 8, 12, said that he who follows me, he who is my disciple, he who has trusted me, a Savior and Lord has the light in him, the light of life. In other words, Jesus physically is no longer here on earth, but his disciples has Jesus in their hearts, and they become the light of the world. We don't have our own light. Jesus provides the light for us so that we can reflect that light to others. In other words, we don't have our own light. Jesus provides the light for us. Just like the moon. The moon does not shine by itself without the sun. Okay? Because the moon reflects the light from the sun towards the earth. That's why we see the brightness of the moon, especially during the night. And that's also true for us as Christians. As long as we reflect God's light to others, then we become the light of the world. We reflect God's light in us. Well, that's one thing that Jesus say, said, and I would just want to concentrate on the light, but he mentioned also that you are the salt of the earth. Of course, we know uh, during the time, especially, salt is used hmm, to preserve food, to uh, slow down the decaying process of the food. And Jesus said to us, you are the salt of the earth. Now salt has more internal effect. It's more hidden in its effect. You don't see what's going on, but when you marinate a meat, the salt penetrates the meat. And so after a few hours, the meat already has... Uh, absorb the taste of the salt. And he was saying here that you Christians, you my disciples, are the salt of the earth. You preserve the sanity and goodness of this world. Salt enhances the taste. And so Christians and disciples enhances the enjoyment of this wonderful world that God has created. Salt causes thirst. Did you, do you, did you notice that? When you, uh, especially, uh, if you are tired and you put salt in your mouth, you, you, you uh, uh, become more thirsty. And Christians said, and Jesus said to the Christians, you are the salt of the earth. You have to uh, create thirst and craving for what is good and what is righteous in our society. And that's the reason why Jesus told his disciples, you, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. He did not say, get out of the world. Hmm? 
He didn't say separate yourselves from the world. Be in the world, stay in the world, but be salt of the world. And at the same time, he told his disciples, you are the light of the world. Light is more visible. The salt's effect is more invisible behind the scene. Okay? But light is more visible. <coughs> and we are all encouraged and commanded by Jesus not only to be salt of the earth, but also to be light. You must be visible. It must be. Your, your, your Christianity must be external. You must be intentional in your reaching out. You cannot drive the darkness away in this world by, by uh, yelling at the darkness or cursing the darkness. Many people try to do that. <laughs> no? Yelling and cursing the bad things, the sinful things. The dark things in this world, all you need to do if you want the darkness to go away is to turn on the light. Turn on the light. Because when light is on, what does light do? It exposes the wrong way. It exposes danger. It shows the good things. It directs us to the right path. That's when light is on. That's why in, in, in Psalm 119 verse 105 said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Some of you have memorized that verse. And the word there is none other than Jesus Christ. None other than the word of God who became flesh and dwelt among <coughs> us. Another quality of light is that, you know, light is, is bright, okay? When you go closer and closer to the light, okay, it, it will look like I know, more brighter and brighter the closer you get to the light. And the closer you, you, you get to the light, you feel the warmth. Right here, you don't feel any warmth. It's negligible. But the closer you, you get to the light, you feel the warmth of the light. That's a great quality of light. And the closer we get to Jesus Christ, Okay? The brighter our lives be. Okay? The warmer our love for, for Him and for other people. And that's the reason many Christians, they don't stay close to the light and their lives does not so any bright, see any brightness. And they don't become a channel of God's love because they don't have the warmth of the love of God. What does it mean for us? It says you are the light of the world. The plan is for his disciples to shine in the dark world. And who are his disciples? You and me. We are here to shine in this dark world. And how, we, how do we do that? If you have experienced Christ in your heart, if God has changed your life because you have trusted Him as Lord and Savior, then you have a story to tell to the world. Okay? If you have not trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, if you just go to church on a Sunday, and do all the motions, the Christian motions that other Christians do. But you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, then you don't have a story to tell. All you can do is just, you know, invite people to church. But 
or even <laughs> go to them and tell them many other things and talk to, talk to them about so many other things except Jesus. But as light, we have a story to tell to the world. You have a testimony. And I'm so blessed by the testimony we heard last, last Sunday. How God has changed the lives of people. And I'm sure you have experienced that change. If not, then you have to question, Lord, are you ready in my heart? If not, please come and change me. As I've said, being light in the world is being more visible. Unlike the, the, the salt, the effect of the salt is more invisible and behind the scene. But the effect of light is more visible, more outward. And the reason for this is because we have to share our testimony. We have to share the word of God to others. Of course, we know that Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Does any man should boast? So in other words, uh, a person, in order to become a Christian, needs to have faith. Okay? And the Bible also says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. In other words, that person who is not a believer needs to hear the word of God in order for him to have faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And that's the reason why we Christians need to know the verses we need to use in sharing the gospel. Many Christians are so afraid, so scared, so shy to share the gospel because they don't know a word to use, a verse to use in your sharing. Let me repeat that. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. That's the experience of all believers, and especially believers who are here in this room. The reason why we became Christians, the reason why we started trusting in Christ is because we heard somebody <coughs> shared the word of God to us. Question. Are we helping fulfill this plan? You are the light of the world. That's, God's, that's the plan of Jesus. Are we helping fulfill his plan? Well, in other words, Jesus has given us a mission. And it's clearly said in, in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, our mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And now I am with you always. And we must see that, this, that the accomplishment of that mission by looking through the eyes of God. We must have a vision for myself, for yourself, and for us as Christians. My vision is this, to see every disciple who is here becoming a discipler. But, is that a new term, discipler? <laughs> well, I just, I just make it short. A discipler is a, a person who makes disciple. Hmm? Right? And that is the commandment. You can, you, you can see clearly in the Bible. The commandment of Christ before he left the earth is very important because that was, those, were, those were his last words to his disciples. said, go and make 
disciples. Okay? He is talking, he was talking to his disciples, and he told them, go and make disciples. In other words, every disciple should become a discipler. That's very clear. And the Apostle Paul has provided a wonderful plan in accomplishing this. So this is, uh, Apostle, Apostle Paul is one of God's uh, uh, Jesus' disciple. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he said, <clears throat> well, first of all, Paul was speaking. And this letter is for Timothy. So he was addressing this to Timothy. So from Paul to Timothy, he said, the things which you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Did you, did you, uh, can you imagine what Paul was saying? Paul, telling Timothy the things that you've heard from me, you entrust to faithful men who will teach others also. In other words, it's not a ministry of just simply addition. Hmm? Paul to Timothy, and then Paul to Titus, and then Paul to Philemon, and Paul. It's not only addition, but it is multiplication. <coughs> okay, let me ask you this question. Um, let me see if I can wake you up. Which would you choose? Okay. Which would you choose? I'm going to give you one million dollars. I hope that's you know that's real, but that's not cannot be real. <laughs> but suppose you know, and you choose which one is which one would you like? I'm going to give you one million dollars today another million dollars tomorrow, another million dollars the following day, I'll be giving one million dollars to you every day for 30 days. How much is the total? Uh, it's simple arithmetic, no? Okay, 30 million in 30 days. You can choose that. Or you can choose the second option. You are going to give me one dollar and I'm going to double it so it becomes two dollars. Give it back to you so you now have two dollars. Tomorrow you're going to give me two dollars and I'm going to multiply it by two again. And then the following day I'm going to multiply it. What you give me? Two dollars by, 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 by two. Multiply it for 30 days. Okay? So the first day is two dollars. Second day is four dollars. Third day is eight dollars. Up to 30 days. So, which one would you choose? 30 million? Or... Thirty million is a big money. But listen. After the service, tell me what your answer for the, the second one. Okay? But I'm going to tell you that the second one is a better option because by the end of 30 days, it's way, way, way more than $30 million. You will, yeah, it will blow your mind away. 
Do you have a calculator? You can do that. Just tell me the answer next. So this is the plan of Jesus. It's not addition. His plan to reach to the world is multiplication. From Paul to Timothy to faithful men and to others also. Sounds like a good plan. Sounds like there's a possibility to reach to the world. But there's a problem. Oh, there's a problem. <coughs> no matter. Just um, we have a problem. Just um. Thank you. Let's go look at the computer. Our computer slept. Okay. Before that purpose, there is a problem. So we we talked about uh, the plan. Now. This is a plan from Jesus. But there is a problem. There is the danger of failure. Okay? The plan is good. The plan is possible. But there's the danger of failure. <coughs> First of all, we already talked about this world is dark. This world is corrupt. This world is sinful. And the world will not cooperate with this plan. At the same time, there is another agent who is trying to prevent, to fulfill God's will. And that's not other than the devil. You know the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, Satan is like a roaring lion seeking to devour. And so Satan is always attacking the Christians. Hmm? Attacking them in their finances, attacking them in their in their marriages, attacking them in their pride. Hmm? If if Satan can 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 inject some some falsehoods in the minds of believers, and that they will fight against each other, then he is succeeding. Succeeding. But at the same time, our own selves becomes a hindrance to God's plan. Why? Because we have this natural tendency to disobey God. We have this natural tendency to commit sin. And that is the danger of failing. What are these uh, things that will prevent us from being successful, being the salt and light of the world? Is also in our text. Jesus said, when salt loses its saltiness. Have you seen salt that lost its saltiness? No. It's always salty. <laughs> and, and the reason why the salt loses or uh, diminished its saltiness is when salt is mixed with impurities. It's not pure. And many Christians do not, do not want to stay pure. Their lives are contaminated with sin, with sin, with cheating, with lying, with gossiping, with pride. And how can God use you if you do not want to rid yourself from those impurities? And that's when the disciples loses his influence in this world. We are here to influence the world. As a salt influence the whole meat, for example, when it's marinated in the meat, the, the, the salt penetrates 
the needs. <coughs> and we are here to penetrate this society with God's goodness. How do we become tasteless? How do we become, how do we lose our saltiness when we neglect our own spiritual growth? When you neglect your own spiritual growth, you lose your saltiness. When you go day by day without reading the Word of God, without praying, without your quiet times in the Lord, you lose your saltiness. When you are right there with other unbelievers, other, other people who don't believe, and you do and say and act the way they do, you lose your saltiness. When we refuse to participate in the political uh, activities, like the right to vote, you are US citizen, you have to vote and exercise that right in order to affect the outcome of the election so that whoever is elected will be used by God so that we will have more freedom in sharing the gospel. So when we neglect being present in a secular society to promote righteousness and well-being and peace and order in society, then we are not acting like the salt of the earth. Some Christians, they just don't care what happens to society. Some Christians, they just don't care. <coughs> uh, I want to separate myself from, from everybody. I'll just mingle with church people. No. Jesus Christ did not call you to separate yourself from the world. What happens when there is a lack of Christian influence in society? Acceptance of gay marriage. Did you notice that? They now for also forbid prayers in schools. People become confused which bathroom to use. Huh? How many of you have seen the movie Frozen? Nice movie, children's movie. There's now a new proposal in, in doing a sequel for that movie. You know what? The sequel, the proposed sequel, is that in this new Frozen sequel, they will endorse lesbian relationships woman to woman relationship in order to teach our children that gay and lesbians are normal lifestyle and you know why these things are happening because of the lack of christian influence because christians are not acting like salt of the earth Jesus himself, who is the Son of God, who is our Savior, the Messiah, he mingled with unbelievers. He, he spoke with tax collectors and sinners. With prostitutes. With the religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes and even Samaritans. Why do we separate ourselves from sinners. Some, some Christians or even Christian leaders will say, oh, don't go to that place. Don't join that association. Don't go to 
of that party, you might be contaminated by the people there. So what happens? There's no Christian influence everywhere. That's the problem. When light is hidden, or has been put under a basket, then nobody can see the light. And that is when the disciples themselves refuses or neglects to shine or to share Jesus Christ to others. As I've said, shining is more outward, more visible, more audible in society. When we stop attending church, when we, when we neglect going to Bible studies, when we uh, stop fellowshipping with other believers, then we stop shining. When we make compromises in our standards, in the way we live, then we stop shining. When we don't intentionally share the gospel to others, then we stop shining. When we don't create opportunities where the, wherein the gospel is seen and heard, then we stop shining as Christians. And that is a problem. That's a problem that Jesus himself has perceived. Salt losing its saltiness. Light being hide, hidden under a basket. And so Jesus ended with a purpose. <clears throat> the reason why we do what we should what we should do. The reason what, why we do what we should do. All this is for the glory of God in verse 16. So that people will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He created the world for his glory. He sent Abraham to be the father of nations for his glory. He sent Moses to lead the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt for his glory. Jesus came here to save us from our sins and he did it for the glory of God. In fact, Jesus did everything for the glory of God. And so should we. Jesus spoke the truth so that the glory of God be manifested. Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the, the 5,000 so that the glory of God be manifested. Jesus died and rose again so that the glory of God be manifested. for the glory of God. What does it tell us? If we do things, if we do God's work using our own strength and energy, then who gets the glory? Because I did it on my own. Did you see that? Huh? Did you see the application? Okay? That if you do things using your own strength, using your own willpower, then after accomplishing it, who gets the glory? You, because I did it on my own without God's help. That's the reason why the third is very important. We would need His power to do this so that God gets the glory, not we. And just like what Jesus said in Luke 24, verse 49, Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, who's talking again to his disciples, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. 
he wants his disciples to do this, but he wants them also to be empowered to do it. Because he knows that they cannot do it on their own. You cannot live your Christian life on your own. You cannot live a victorious Christian life on your own. You need the strength and the power that God provides. And just like our salvation, you know, I mentioned this verse a while ago, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's not because of you. No? It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. Because if it is a result of your good works, then you can easily boast. See? God saved me because I'm good. Huh? And that's also true in living the Christian life, in obeying God's plan for our lives. We need God's strength. We need God's power. And this is what he said in Matthew 20, 28 verse 20. Said in this break commission, I said, And lo, I am with you always. And the premise is this that if you make disciples, if you go and make disciples, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, most Christians miss the point of this promise. And the point of this promise is this, that if you involve yourselves in making disciples, he will show up in a great and mighty and marvelous way. Okay? Do you want God to show up in a great and marvelous way in your life? Of course, Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And many Christians know that. And many Christians believe that. And many Christians think that Jesus lives in me. And that's all they know. They did not realize that our lives is like a boat. And a boat has a control. Uh, what do you call that? <laughs> steering wheel. No? The one who is holding the steering wheel is the one who is controlling the boat. And there was a time when, when, when Jesus invited his disciples to come, let us cross this lake into this boat. And so they all went into the boat. <coughs> and since most of them are, you know, fishermen, oh, we know the sea, we know the water. So Jesus just, uh, just lie down and sleep at the back of the boat. We'll wake you up when we get there. But what happened? There was a storm. Strong winds and big waves. And the, the, the boat was filling up with water. So they were, they were scared. They feared their lives. And so they went to Jesus and said, wake up. Don't you care, Lord? We are perishing. We're dying. You know, most believers are like that. They want Jesus Christ to be in their lives. And Jesus really promised that I will never leave you nor forsake you. But they just allow Jesus to stay there in one corner of their lives. Jesus wants to be in control. Because when Jesus is in control of your life, then he will also provide the power and the strength for you to live your life victoriously, your Christian life victoriously. And this promise is true. And lo, I am with you always. It means, yes, I'm with you always, but I am planning to show up in a great and marvelous way if you go and make disciples. 
If you obey me. If there's a world out there who needs Christ. Many Christians would think, oh, they're not right. Oh, that one is not right. That person is not yet right. When Jesus was there 2,000 years ago, he told his disciples, you, you, you think that there's still four months before the harvest? Look again. They are now white for harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You are a Christian. You are a disciple. Jesus is encouraging you to be one of his laborers, one of his servants. Will you be willing to be a follower of Jesus? You know, Jesus said, <clears throat> follow me. Matthew uh, uh, Matthew 11, 14, I'm not sure. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You think Jesus was just joking when he said that? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men? No. If you believe and if you are decided to follow Jesus, then becoming more and more a fisher of man should be evident <coughs> in our lives. Okay? Because that's, the, that's, the, that's just in one sentence that Jesus said, follow me and he will make you. Follow Jesus and he will make you a fisher of men. Why is it that I'm not yet fishing for men? Why is it that I'm not yet uh, witnessing or sharing the gospel to others? Maybe you're following Jesus way far behind him. Yeah. Come closer to him so that the light will be brighter and so that the heat from the, hot, from the light will become warmer. Okay. Time to end. Anyway, let me just... Uh, read to you a poem that uh, has been a blessing to me in my life uh, ever since I was in college. Because uh, being in the college age, you are so dependent on friendship with other uh, people. Yeah, but even now, but more so as a, a young person is still growing up. And here's a, here's a, here's a point. Said my friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth we walk by we walk I walked with you by day and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell the story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have just led me safe to him. Although we live together here on earth, you never told me of the second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things and that's true. I called you friend and trusted you. But I learn now that it's too late. You could have kept me from this fate. We walked by day and talked by night, and yet you showed me not the light. You've let me live and love and die. And you knew I'd never live on high. Yes, I called you friend in life. I trusted you through joy and strife. And yet on coming to this dreadful end, I cannot now call you my friend. Do you love your friends? Are you sure they're going to heaven? Maybe not. Do you love your spouse, 
you love your children, you love your neighbors, you love your relatives? Have they heard the gospel? Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are both salt and light at the same time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts today. We thank you for your word. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will keep this in our minds, in our hearts, and at the same time, be willing to obey whatever things that you want us to do. We commit everything to your hands now. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's all right, let us sing our close again.